Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor and privilege to formally declare the Indo Asia Pacific Conference 2023. I'm Yochiro Sato, Dean of the College of Asia Pacific Studies at Ritsuik University. And I'm delighted to be a host for today's ceremony. This program is co hosted by Pacific University and the Japan Cabinet Office under the theme. 50 years of Japan ASEAN friendship, process, and future challenges. I trust that this program will be both enlightening and for all. Without further ado, I extend a warm welcome to Hiroshi Yoneyama, Vice President of Ritsumeik and Asia Pacific. I extend a warm welcome to Professor Hiroshi Yoneyama. Vice President of Ritsumeik and Asia Pacific University, as he graces the stage to deliver the opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sato. Good morning, and thank you for joining us this morning. Um, the year 2023 marks the 50th anniversary of Japan ASEAN uh, friendship and cooperation, starting with Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines, Singapore, and Thailand in 1967. The group's membership expanded to 10 countries by 1999. Japan has stood side by side with ASEAN from its inception. Japan signed the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation in Southeast Asia in 2004, deepening its cooperative uh, partnership with ASEAN. The partnership between ASEAN and Japan has withstood various challenges to the security of the region during the Cold War and the post-Cold War periods. The peace and prosperity <coughs> this partnership has brought to the region manifest today on this campus of Ritsumeikan Asia Pacific University, where future leaders representing ASEAN member countries live and study with Japanese students. Today's forum has been made possible in cooperation with the Cabinet Office of Japan to celebrate this great anniversary and 50 years of accomplishment. APU is proud to be part of this honorable event. Experts in this panel sessions today will address some of the ongoing challenges in the Indo-Pacific. I am very much looking forward to learning from their various perspectives. I am convinced that today's discussions will lead to a better mutual understanding of the ASEAN member countries and help foster a harmonious relationship between Japan and ASEAN. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Yoneyama, for your insightful remarks. Now I'm honored to invite Mr. Noriyuki Shikata, the esteemed Cabinet Secretary for Public Affairs, to grace our stage for the keynote address. Mr. Shikata will participate via video message. Let us collectively extend our warmest welcome to Mr. Shikata with a round of applause. Excellencies, distinguished guests, I'm pleased to have this opportunity to give remarks at the Asia-Pacific Conference 2023. Unfortunately, I'm currently in Dubai attending COP28 with Prime Minister Kishida, and therefore I'm delivering my message through this uh, video. Japan's relationship with ASEAN started half a century ago, when we decided to begin official dialogues ahead of the rest of the world. Since then, Japan and ASEAN have expanded and deepened its relations 
to become not only major trading and investment partners, but also true friends with heart-to-heart -heart connections based on a wide range of people-to-people -people exchanges. Today, the international community is at the historic turning point and the international order based on the rule of law is under serious challenge. We also face complex and compounding challenges such as climate change, global health, and social disparities. This year, Japan as the G7 presidency bears the important responsibility of leading international discussions based on the outcome of the G7 Hiroshima summit, aiming to create an international society of cooperation rather than division and conflict, and contributing to world peace and stability. At the G7 Hiroshima summit, Prime Minister Kishida invited guest leaders from ASEAN, sharing our recognition of the importance of universal principles such as respect for sovereignty and territorial integrity, as well as the principles of the UN Charter and the importance of a free and open international order based on the rule of law. We, conf we confirmed our commitment to addressing global issues in cooperation with partners beyond the G7. To do this, it is essential to understand and jointly tackle the challenges and vulnerabilities of countries in the global south. Japan and ASEAN have already advanced cooperation on various global challenges. At COP28, where I am participating now, we are discussing climate change and other related issues. Under the Asia Zero Emission Community, ASEAN, Japan and ASEAN countries are collaborating to promote decarbonization and sustainable economic growth in line with the realities of the respective Asian countries in the region, aiming for the decarbonization of the entire region. Furthermore, under the Japan ASEAN Comprehensive Connectivity Initiative, Japan is cooperating with ASEAN on realizing quality infrastructure, soft infrastructure, digital connectivity, maritime cooperation, supply chains, electricity connectivity, as well as human and knowledge connectivity. Currently, transport infrastructure development projects worth 2.8 trillion yen or US dollars 18 billion are being implemented. Additionally, Japan and ASEAN are promoting cooperation in the fields of trade, supply chains, clean energy, decarbonization, infrastructure, tax, and, and anti-corruption under the frameworks of IPEF, Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, as well as CPTPP. 2023 marks the 50th anniversary of Japan-ASEAN friendship and cooperation, and in December, the ASEAN-Japan Commemorative Summit meeting will be held in Tokyo. Out of this, I hope that this event will further boost our friendly relations between Japan and ASEAN and deepen constructive discussions about our future cooperation possibilities. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shikata, for your valuable insights. Please allow us a minute to prepare the stage for speakers. Now, we shall delve into our panel discussion. Panelists, please come up on stage. Thank uh -huh. 
Here are today's panelists. From left to right, Professor Kim Jie. Professor Kei Koga. <laughs> Miss Jui Chakravorty. <laughs> Miss Michio Ishida. and Professor Kitty Prasutius by remote participation. The panelists will begin by briefly sharing their thoughts on the 50th anniversary <coughs> of ASEAN Japan friendship and cooperation. Okay. So I will ask each presenter to speak to about five to seven minutes max, and then after that, I would like to proceed to the Q&A session and discussion. So let's start with, uh, uh, first I would like to introduce uh, Professor Kogake, uh, Associate Professor at Nanyang Technological University. Professor Koga is an expert on international politics in the Indo-Pacific region and has published numerous books, including Managing Great Power Politics, ASEAN, Institutional Strategy, and South China Sea, Reinventing Regional Security Institutions, Power Shift, ideas and institutional change in Asia and Africa, as well as many academic journal articles. Professor Koga will explore ASEAN-Japan relations, Southeast Asian nations' ties with Japan, and shed light on regional governance and foreign policy matters. Professor Koga, please. Um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for your kind introduction, Professor Sato. And the, uh, thank you very much for having me here uh, today. Uh, and I would like to uh, particularly the, uh, thank the uh, uh, APU and also the uh, Cabinet Office uh, to, uh, for inviting me here. Um, this year, 2023 uh, marks the uh, uh, 50th anniversary or 50th year of ASEAN-Japan uh, friendship and cooperation. And in fact, the, uh, these bilateral relations have come a long way uh, given the fact that the, uh, uh, the very uh, first ASEAN-Japan uh, the meeting in 1973 uh, was to negotiate uh, over the negotiate and then also alleviate trade tensions uh, over Japan's synthetic rubber uh, trade uh, that would de impede the uh, uh, Southeast Asia's the, uh, natural rubber trade. So um, in this presentation, I'd like to discuss the uh, past, present, and the uh, future of the uh, Japan-ASEAN uh, relations. And also, I actually included the uh, political and security relations at the, uh, my presentation focus. But the, uh, uh, I would like to talk more broadly about the uh, relations, and then also the, uh, at the end of the presentation, I'd like to discuss the uh, challenges that the uh, Japan and the uh, ASEAN uh, are facing, as well as their uh, future implications. So first, present. Um, as many have, this is actually uh, maybe like a little bit too small uh, to read, but the, uh, as many have, of you have already known, the current status of the uh, Japan ASEAN uh, relations uh, and ASEAN, uh, sorry, Japan Southeast Asia relations are, are significantly positive. The, uh, economically, uh, the uh, Japan is now ASEAN's the third largest uh, the, uh, trading partner, and then Japan also uh, is the uh, fourth 
uh, largest uh, source of the FDI for the region. And diplomatically, Japan has supported the ASEAN's initiative, uh, including the establishment of the ASEAN-led institutions in 1990s, uh, which include the uh, ASEAN Regional Forum, East Asia Summit, uh, and the ASEAN Defense Ministers Meeting Plus, and so on and so forth. And also, the, on the defense issue, which is uh, always difficult, uh, because the, uh, um, the, uh, there's the, uh, some uh, the, uh, historical legacy that Japan has uh, in the uh, past. But then the, uh, it actually, the Japan and ASEAN got over it, and then the now like, the Japan has the, uh, its own uh, initiative called the uh, Vientiane uh, the, uh, Vision, uh, in 19, uh, which was the, uh, uh, co uh, the uh, conclu uh, issued in 2016, and then the uh, upgraded to the uh, uh, the uh, Vientiane Vision 2.0 uh, the uh, in 19, uh, sorry 2019. Um, that was the uh, uh, Japan kind of promoting more the uh, capacity building program, uh, defense exchange, and so on and so forth. And in addition to that, uh, most recently uh, Japan created the uh, uh, the scheme called Offshore uh, uh, Offshore Security uh, Assistance (OSA). Uh, the defense version of uh, defense version of the uh, ODA, and then uh, the Japan prioritized the Malaysia and the Philippines as the uh, uh, the recipients of the uh, this OSA, and then uh, in the future uh, they were thinking about the Vietnam to be included. Um, Social economic development is the one of the uh, uh, some uh, the core pillars that the Japan has toward the uh, Southeast Asia infrastructure development, and then also the people-to-people uh, uh, the -people exchange. Those are the uh, really important components of the uh, Japan's policy toward the uh, Southeast Asia, and they actually uh, they, uh, try to facilitate more mutual uh, the, uh, uh, the understanding and uh, confidence. So uh, because of these the, uh, positive uh, the, uh, cooperative activities, then like the uh, uh, Southeast Asian countries uh, now consider Japan as the uh, uh, most trustful country according to the uh, other survey conducted by the uh, uh, Singaporean uh, the, uh, institution, uh, research institution uh, called the, uh, um, uh, the uh, ICS uh, Yusef Ishak uh, the, uh, Institute. So how did we get there? Um, I, I think like, there are many uh, the, uh, historical and uh, landmark events that like, we can identify, but like, I'd like to emphasize the importance of the uh, Fukuda Doctrine in the uh, 1977. Uh, the uh, uh, Prime Minister Fukuda uh, went to the uh, Philippines and made a speech about the uh, Japan Southeast Asia and the Japan ASEAN relations. And then there, uh, the, he actually emphasized the, uh, uh, the three things. The one is the uh, Japan would not become a military power. Uh, second, the uh, Japan would uh, facilitate mutual trust and confidence through heart to heart uh, interaction. And then third, uh, Japan would be an uh, equal partner of the ASEAN. Obviously, this is just the, uh, a statement, so you have to back up the, uh, uh, their kind of actions and behavior uh, later on, but then which uh, the Japan and the ASEAN actually did. And then the, uh, uh, those are the, uh, the things that the Japan uh, and the ASEAN uh, cooperated and then they facilitated the friendship uh, between them. Now, the, uh, the, uh, uh, right now, the, uh, oh, sorry, this is the, uh, uh, I think, Okay, so uh, now the uh, Japan uh, and then the uh, ASEAN has the uh, really uh, the uh, good relations uh, with each other, and but the, uh, despite this positive uh, bilateral relationship, uh, Japan and Southeast Asia are now facing the challenges. Um, I think like uh, this one, yeah, challenges are the uh, because this uh, relationship is not completely independent uh, from the uh, ongoing change in the strategic environment. And the first one is the most importantly. Uh, the U.S.-China uh, strategic competition. Uh, the, although the both great powers seek a way to manage this competition, uh, the intensification of rivalry is not going away uh, in anytime soon. And then this would on, not only affect the uh, uh, regional balance of power, but also the uh, order building in the Indo-Pacific and beyond. And then this would actually have the potential to wedge, uh, drive a wedge between the ASEAN and the uh, Japan. Um, and also the uh, intra-regional political and economic issues would be uh, pose the uh, another uncertainty uh, in the region. Uh, as you uh, know, the uh, Myanmar crisis uh, the, uh, and also Myanmar coup and then the uh, Ukraine war and then the uh, Middle Eastern uh, crisis 
Uh, those are the uh, really important components of the uh, uh, shaping the uh, international politics, and uh, this needs to be uh, the, uh, taken uh, into the uh, consideration when the, uh, they think about the uh, uh, world and then their action towards the uh, international order. And then the, uh, also the, uh, uh, the, there is an emerging surgence of the uh, global uh, the South. Uh, we actually need to uh, take into consideration how the uh, so-called rest, not non-great powers, are thinking about uh, the uh, those things. So, okay, so the, uh, because the, uh, my kind of time is really limited, I'm just going to jump into the, uh, what I actually uh, think the future of the Japan-ASEAN uh, uh, relations. And I think they, uh, there are three things. The one is the uh, shaping regional order together. Uh, this is really important because the, uh, to date, the uh, Japan and the ASEAN has looked inwardly. Uh, they actually cared about the bilateral relations, but they didn't actually talk about their cooperation beyond the, uh, those two bilateral relations. So we need to actually think about what kind of cooperation we can do in shaping international order. And then secondly, expanding ASEAN's strategic option. Uh, I know that the ASEAN has developed the, its own capabilities, and then the materially, uh, the, uh, they have been uh, the, uh, wealthier than before, but then at the same time, uh, the, there are still uh, other things that Japan can contribute, particularly in the uh, security uh, 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 the, uh, issues. So uh, the, I guess the uh, OSA that uh, Japan actually launched would be the, uh, a really good kind of venue to uh, uh, focus on. And then the uh, thirdly, renewing the Japan Southeast Asia and ASEAN Equal Partnership. What I mean by this is the people-to-people uh, -people relations uh, between the uh, ASEAN and Japan is going to be more important. Nowadays, like we kind of uh, uh, take the information uh, provided by the uh, adults in the great powers, but I guess the, uh, there are many perspectives uh, in the uh, small and then the middle power uh, nations. And then the, uh, we always emphasize the importance of the agency in uh, Japan and then Southeast Asia. But like, without actually understanding the, uh, what they are thinking about through the people-to-people uh, -to -people relations, particularly the, uh, the media and the journalist exchanges, then the, we might not actually uh, the, uh, get the, uh, what actually other uh, middle power and small power are thinking about. So that is actually the, uh, what I think the, uh, beyond the 50th anniversary, uh, we might want to actually uh, take the action to strengthen the uh, ties between ASEAN and Japan. I'll stop here, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Koga, for your insightful contribution. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Kiki Prasutz, joining us remotely. He is a professor of international relations at the Faculty of Political Science, Tamasat University in Thailand. He's a member of the advisory committee for the International Studies Center at the Thai Ministry of Foreign Affairs and used to serve as a strategic committee at the Thai Ministry of Defense. The Professor Prasut's expertise lies in examining Southeast Asian nations' connections with Japan, China, the US, India, and South Korea from a Thai vantage point. He will delve into governance matters and diplomatic concerns within the region, providing invaluable insights into these intricate dynamics. Professor Prasutsuk. Minasan, good morning. It's my great honor and pleasure to be here with you today to commemorate the 50th anniversary of Japan ASEAN dialogue relations. I would like to share my view on two accounts, reflecting the past and projecting the future. I, I try not to repeat what my colleague, Professor Konga, has said, and I try to share my view from ASEAN perspective or a Thai perspective. First, uh, in the past, when we started our dialogue relation, in 1973, uh, we can see that our relationship was not healthy. We had trade deficit. The memory of World War II remained vivid in people's minds. The latter year, 1974, when Prime Minister Tanaka 
visited the region. He faced with protests in Thailand, anti-Japanese protests in Thailand, and also riots in Jakarta, Indonesia. So the problem is that we did not understand each other well. And how did the relationship get improved? There are two important things here. First, on cultural exchange. Professor Konga has mentioned about Fukuda doctrine, the heart-to-heart -heart policy under the leadership of Prime Minister Fukuda that created a bunch of exchange program, youth exchange between Japan and ASEAN country that create a mutual understanding between both sides. And importantly, it helped ASEAN people to get to know each other through youth exchange program, scholarship program. Myself, I got to know a lot of friends from ASEAN in Japan when I studied there. And during the 1980s, Japanese soft power came to be very popular uh, in Thailand and other ASEAN countries. Manga, animations, movie, drama, J-pop, music became very popular when ASEAN household had more television sets. And in the meantime, the official development assistant ODA in terms of infrastructure have been very useful for ASEAN country as a platform for their economic development. So, I mean, this cultural exchange, ODA, created good condition, necessary condition for our friendship. But it's not sufficient yet. The sufficient condition come from the latter half of 1980. With the appreciation, Japan came to invest extensively in manufacturing industry in ASEAN country, including Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia. So uh, that we created economic interdependence partnership for the first stage. And 10 years later, after Japan came to invest, 1997, we remember the ASEAN financial crisis that hit the region and Japan very fast to lend a hand to help with the Miyazawa initiative, loans, a low interest loan, assistance to help boost the economy. So ASEAN is very grateful for uh, Japan assistance. And into 2000, we developed uh, FTA, free trade agreement under the economic partnership agreement. Japan also uh, initiated the Japan ASEAN Integration Fund, Japan ASEAN Integration Fund, JAIF, which is very useful for ASEAN in terms of capacity building. And in fact, uh, earlier in the 1990s, Japan was instrumental and impetus to push forward ASEAN Free Trade Agreement or AFTA, ASEAN Free Trade Agreement, because ASEAN would like to have more and more investment from Japan. So we decided to integrate further in terms of Free Trade Agreement to be attractive for Japan to continue investing in ASEAN. So overall, our relationship has developed steadily and came to have solid relation and strong partnership. I think overall, Japan has been very successful in its policy toward ASEAN country, considering the Cheki start in the 1960, 1970, as I said earlier. So then, what next? What can we expect in the future? I think first we have to look at the global situation and challenges. I think there are at least three challenges nowadays. First, geopolitics and also geoeconomics, increasing rivalry, increasing competition between great power. Professor Konga also mentioned about that. Secondly, uh, the non-traditional security or new security challenges, human security, climate change, maritime security, and so on. And third, demographic and social change, which tend to be uh, increasing problems in ASEAN country, including Thailand, aging, and also rural depopulations. 
So here I would like to suggest three uh, aspects of co cooperation further between Japan and ASEAN. The three aspects come from uh, the three pillars of ASEAN community. ASEAN community has three pillars, uh, economics, socio-cultural aspect pillars, and also security pillars. First, I would like to emphasize socio-cultural pillars. Uh, I think people-to-people -people exchange with Japan has been doing very well with ASEAN. We should continue that. And also, I would like to emphasize local-to-local -local exchange. I mean, the exchange between localities in Japan and ASEAN country in terms of prefectures, city, town, uh, local to local relations. That would be, uh, I think, interesting and important because country like Thailand, we would like to learn from Japan how to cope with aging, how to cope with uh, rural depopulations. Good practices and lessons learned would be very important for country like Thailand and other country that will uh, have aging society. And secondly, on economics, the issue of supply chains, investment remain important. I think so far, accumulated investment from Japan is the largest in ASEAN, and we would like it to continue to be so uh, in terms of production network that we call earlier and supply chains. And I think the investment now would be moving toward more service services based industries and i think uh quality infrastructure that japan has uh mentioned since the abe administration i think that would be the thing that ASEAN country is expected as well uh, we would like to diversify our infrastructure would not like to rely on one country alone so japan infrastructure would be very important for ASEAN country. And we also look forward for Japan role in the IPEP, Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, which also emphasize supply chains. And last but not least, in security. I think ASEAN country uh, are getting harsh between great power rivalry. We're looking for a third pole country, a third pole country. And Japan can also function in that way by an independent role as a major power, which so far Japan has done, has been doing very well in ASEAN as a quite independent major power. So here, I would like to suggest three things in security. First, on uh, non-traditional security, non-traditional security, particularly maritime security, environmental security, climate change, HADR, humanitarian assistance, and disaster relief. Japan uh, would be very helpful for ASEAN in terms of capacity building and also beyond that. And in uh, Myanmar, I think the peace process in Myanmar, ASEAN would need Japan to help quite similar to uh, what happened in Cambodia in the 1990s when Japan sent peacekeeping operation there. I think in the peace process, Japan, ASEAN would like Japan to be involved. And the next thing is peacekeeping operation overall. I think in, in Thailand, uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, we would be happy to work with Japan in terms of peacekeeping operation overseas, not only in Myanmar, uh, anywhere in the world. And also another thing is on defense technology. Defense technology, I think Japan has excelled in many technology and uh, country in ASEAN would like to uh, cooperation with Japan on that front as well. So uh, I think uh, that is my opinions, my view. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Kiti-san, for the enlightening presentation. Now let's welcome Professor Kim Jie, 
associate professor at Ritzmaker Asia Pacific University. Professor Kim holds an MA in Security Studies from the Korean National Defense University, PhD in Security Studies from Jawaharlal Nehru University and the University of Sydney, and currently teaches international relations in the Asia Pacific at the College of Asia Pacific Studies at APU. She has published numerous articles on international politics in the Indo-Pacific region and has a book the future of the South China Sea, forthcoming. We're looking forward to reading that. <laughs> Professor Kim will give insight into the potential for Japan to take the lead in fostering collaboration with South Korea, India, Australia, and other nations within the Indo-Pacific region. Professor Kim. Yeah. Thank you, um, Sato-sensei. Uh, first of all, I would like to um, extend my gratitude uh, towards um, the cabinet office and uh, our university, APU, and also ICAPS uh, for co-hosting uh, this timely event while listening to uh, so Professor Koga and Professor Kitty. Uh, it was very um, insightful, informative. I, can, uh, I was able to learn how timeliness uh, of this event and also talking about um, uh, the increasing uh, the role of uh, the ASEAN and also uh, navigating uh, the way to more effectively uh, engaging uh, with this um, uh, the community of uh, ASEAN. So I really hope that I can um, encompass uh, the topics and questions that I'm uh, requested to present uh, today. Uh, and, um, so the theme of the the talk for uh, me today is in Indo-Pacific international politics, and um, it's, uh, it's building on the Professor Koga's and Professor Kitty's presentation, uh, it's, uh, my contribution would be mostly focused on the regional security at uh, a point of view, and I uh, would like to uh, suggest a central question first and uh, discuss the examples of the relevant countries of the uh, the topical interest today, uh, including Australia, Japan, and South Korea, they're based on their official uh, the policy documents published by each um, country. So the central uh, central question is that, uh, com um, well, when we uh, the capture the commonalities of the, the countries of interest um, today, which is Australia, and Japan, South Korea, is that they are all uh, treaty allies of the United States. So the central question is that how do these, um, uh, the US allies uh, in the region, they engage uh, with each other and uh, not only with US and other allies, but also uh, other countries beyond uh, that alliance relations. And the particularly, uh, I would like to figure out uh, what is new about this. So the before, uh, so called the emergence of era of Indo-Pacific. Uh, so it was around 2017, of officially the US adopted the concept of BOLIB, um, uh, uh, which is uh, initially uh, proposed by Shinzo Abe. And uh, before then and after then, the how this uh, narrative and concept of Indo-Pacific actually has changed um, in terms of the uh, foreign and security policy of these countries. And the answer to this question uh, that could be explained in uh, two different but closely related points. So the first one is uh, whether uh, these uh, US key treaty bilateral allies in the region, uh, whether these countries embraced the concept of Indo-Pacific or not. So if we can say confidently, yes, they did, and that means that is the major uh, the change before and after the emergence of Indo-Pacific because, um, well, in, 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 a, in a nutshell, that means uh, these countries, uh, yeah, started to have the region-wide <coughs> policy vision, their own uh, the policy towards uh, the broader the region of Indo-Pacific. So, um, in the, the second uh, the point is how, um, how, as a part of their own uh, Indo-Pacific, the policy, how uh, they were able to deliver uh, this policy. And uh, I would like to focus on uh, the changes in, um, in additions to 
the, the, the San Francisco system, so called uh, the hub and spoke system, which is centered on the US bilateral security alliance system. So while maintaining and reinforcing these bilateral alliance relations and what is new. So in addition to that bilateral relations, what uh, these US key treaty allies uh, have been requested to do more. And um, the, the, the new, um, uh, the changes that we could find, uh, probably the one of the key changes could be uh, security network. Uh, so whether these countries accepted and embraced in the past by concept or not, and a second, how uh, they delivered, and whether uh, the sec uh, security network became uh, their central the policy or not. So that would be the major uh, the discussion point today. So before I uh, move on, I think um, perhaps the quick um, uh, explanation of what security network is uh, could be are required in our discussion today. So that back in 2016, the then uh, US uh, Defense Secretary Ash Carter uh, the published an article in Foreign Affairs Journal uh, titled the, the Rebalance in Asia Pacific Security. So um, un under the, the Obama administration, uh, this is the, the, one of the way of um, um, disseminating uh, their policy directions in uh, in Asia the Pacific region. And one of the, uh, the important quotes uh, from his article is that it is about security network. So security network enables the regional players to come together, to plan together, train together, and operate together in an uh, interconnected region. And to, uh, I, I personally think this is important, share the burden for uh, regional stability. So. Um, it, this is uh, nothing to do with uh, what we observed in the following administration under uh, Trump administration, particularly the American first policy, because the key difference is that the security network and sharing the burden, that is building on, um, building on the U.S. existing uh, the policy of bilateral alliances, and in fact, going to the direction of actually strengthening the bilateral alliances. So we can uh, connect the, the two dots, which is bilateral alliance and uh, the security, the network. So, um, the, so uh, it will in, um, so yeah, so the, the conclusion, uh, the very brief conclusion for the, the uh, sake of time now I can uh, present is that the, these are regional, the U.S. key treaty allies embracing uh, the Indo-Pacific concept and also to, to develop their own uh, free and open, in, uh, free and open Indo-Pacific uh, the narrative first and second. Uh, their engagement in security network that is um, change. No fundamental doesn't make any fundamental change in the current U.S. alliance system, but more like they do. Um, uh, they're doing um, the roles of uh, strengthening their alliance with the United States. That means um, the U.S. allies are having their own region-wide vision and U.S. allies pursuing security cooperation with regional countries outside of the alliance system. That in fact coincide with U.S. interest uh, in the region. So uh, we can say that um, the, all three of the countries of interest in today's talk, Japan, Australia, and Korea, uh, the conclusion is yes, they embraced the Indo-Pacific concept. Actually, Japan is, is the country. The Shinzo Abe was the, um, the yeah, the, the political figure who uh, introduced the concept of the confluence of two seas, Pacific Ocean, Indian Ocean, uh, back in uh, 2007, and also, uh, well, officially introduced the concept of FOIP in a free and open Indo-Pacific back in 20. Uh, 16, and uh, uh, not only Japan, but also Australia, and uh, most recently South Korea, they also accepted, and also to publish their own vision of Indo-Pacific, and uh, uh, yeah, they formally uh, included this into their own uh, foreign and security the policy. Regarding the security network, yes, um, we can see the, from their public, uh, the government publications that how they uh, they, uh, they are proactively um, pursuing and promoting and actually planning 
the security the network. In case of Japan, um, the recent um, Kishida's, uh, Prime Minister Kishida's uh, visit to, uh, to New Delhi, that uh, he um, uh, presented uh, uh, the new plan, new plan for uh, free and open in the Pacific. So uh, the, that, that is uh, the upgrade, the version of the free and open in the Pacific. And this new plan for free and open in the Pacific, according to the, the the, uh, according to um, the, the concept paper published by the foreign, uh, so, yeah, thank you, Sato Sensei, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, that yeah, this document uh, uh, the strengthened the significance of the building networks among countries. And in the Australian uh, the government publication, we can see that how minilateralism becomes a key specific tool of security network and South Korea is currently in progress of building a security network. So uh, this is it for uh, now and I would like to discuss further the after the, the panel discussion. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jeff, for the insight, insightful presentation. Now let's welcome Ms. Jui Chakravorty from Nikkei Asia. She's a multiple award-winning journalist, works with reporters in Nikkei Asia's bureaus around the world to conceptualize, manage, and execute cross-border editorial projects that experiment with new types of coverage and presentation and advance Nikkei Asia's digital journalism. Most recently, Ms. Chakravorty was based in San Francisco as the founder of digital journalism startup Beyond TV, which trained aspiring journalists in under-resourced communities and produced stories for clients around the world. She will offer us a view of the dynamic yet challenging landscape of the Indo-Pacific region's quest for stability. Ms. Chakravorty. Thank you. Good morning. Um, thank you to all the organizers for putting this very timely event together. And to Dean Sato for moderating this panel, to my co-panelists, um, and to all of you for joining us here in person and online. Um, I will keep my opening statements relatively brief um, and broad brush, and I look forward to delving into details uh, once we get discussions going. Um, so as, as Dean Sato mentioned, I head special projects at Nikkei Asia, which is the English language Asia-focused news publication arm of Nikkei. Uh, I work with journalists in our bureaus across Asia and in the US. Uh, I moved from San Francisco to Tokyo and joined Nikkei last year. Uh, I had a startup before this, and then I was at Reuters before that for about a decade. Um, in my short time here in Japan, um, I've seen America's appetite for what is happening here uh, in Japan, in Northeast Asia, certainly in Southeast Asia, um, grow significantly. And Nikkei Asia has gone from being a news organization that covered Asia for Asia um, to one that covers Asia for the world. Um, our audience, particularly in the US, has been you know, on a steady incline. And this is in part, I think, for the same reason that Japan has come to play an even more crucial role for ASEAN which is China's engagement in the region and the dots that connect that to pretty much the entire world. Um, and that has also been a game changer in terms of regional cooperative blocks such as ASEAN, where Japan appears to be becoming a very trusted extra regional power. One of the things I learned pretty quickly after moving to Japan was the concept of nimawashi, which is the idea of consensus building. Every stakeholder gets a say and is on board before an announcement. So policy is made by consensus. 
so that when Japan does announce something, you know it's already in motion. Unlike America, where an announcement is basically designed to drive resourcing, right? So when Japan says it will contribute to a new fund assisting decarbonization efforts or announces a new official security assistance program under which it will supply equipment to friendly countries, they have already earmarked those funds and planned specific places where those will go. Or the national security strategy announced earlier this year. Of course, it adds heft and significance when announced but it is already policy. And this makes reporting on Japan and its partnerships with ASEAN far simpler. Uh, the more reporting I see from our team in the region, the more convinced I am that ASEAN nations see Japan as an attractive third option that is neither the US nor China. Japan's free and open Indo-Pacific vision can provide a rules-based alternative as some of my co-panelists have mentioned this morning, to China's efforts to reshape Asia's regionalism into a, perhaps a modern day, Sinocentric regional order. It is through that lens that Japan's partnerships, not only with ASEAN members, but also what I like to call ASEAN adjacent countries, like India, Australia, and interest, are, are interesting case studies and I think important projects to watch for journalists covering the region and our audiences in the time to come. Uh, Japan's partnerships with non-ASEAN countries, to which Professor G alluded, will have sweeping effects on the entire ASEAN region, where small and middle powers in Southeast Asia can maintain their sovereignty and shape the regional order. And ASEAN itself is party to six free trade agreements with non-ASEAN countries. And so far, it looks like Japan is working to prove itself as a model for regional cooperation with non-ASEAN members as well as ASEAN countries in several key sectors. And I think maritime security and infrastructure are becoming really the most key spaces to watch. Japan is a maritime nation, right? It does more than 99% of its trade by sea. And when you have waters dominating trade, everything from oil coming from the Gulf to wheat from Europe, trade and the safety of trade become pretty intertwined with security. In fact, I learned recently that the Japanese word for safety and security is the same word. Um, and Japan is prioritizing economic integration, infrastructure, and development along the littoral states of the Indo-Pacific, as well as ASEAN centrality in order to inculcate stability, sustainability, and hopefully a shared vision of the region. And with Beijing's newest territorial map and the controversial nine-dash line, all this becomes a little bit more significant. Even though the region's trade with China does remain strong at roughly $500 billion a year, growth there is slowing. So the key to ASEAN's future will be partnerships, I think, with external powers, particularly Japan, Australia, India, and South Korea, who can provide ASEAN governments with more diverse partnerships and enable them to avoid the bipolar blocks of superpower rivalries. The next phase of the Japan-ASEAN partnership, the way that we look at it, will be about democratizing influence. Ambitious developments stemming from the region's awareness of its role in international order and its conviction that sovereign nations can have influence even if they are not superpowers. So I look forward to discussing, hearing, and learning more today. Thank you. Thanks, Jay. Lastly, I invite Ms. Michio Ishida. Ms. Ishida is a senior correspondent for CNA, formerly Channel News Asia. She was born in Tokyo and raised in Tokyo, New York, and Sao Paulo. 
She has worked as a journalist for such as NHK BS1, Today's Japan, joined the Television Corporation of Singapore, and was appointed the first Tokyo correspondent for Channel News Asia in 2019. Her recent memorable TV coverage includes the Tokyo Olympic Games, the Paralympic Games as broadcast rights holder, the Association of Former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, the Defense of Japan, the Hiroshima G7 Summit, and the Fukushima reaction to wastewater. Ms. Ishida will shed light on the Indo-Pacific region's dynamism and struggle for st stability. Ms. Ishida. Good morning, everyone. How are you doing? Uh, I'm Michio Ishida, senior correspondent for CNA. Um, first of all, I would like to ask you, how many of you have ever watched CNA? Raise your hands. Mm -hmm. Oh, quite a few of you. Thank you. Have you ever seen me on CNA? Oh, <laughs> thank you so much. Okay. Oh, that encourages me very much. Um, well, before I go any further, let me introduce you um, the basic um, things about CNA because um, some of it you may not be familiar. Uh, let me run a little bit here. Oh, okay, the timeline. Um, CNA was founded in 1999 um, as Channel News Asia, and since we've been um, seen regionally on television in 29 countries, in region, uh, basically in the Asia Pacific and part of the Middle East. Um, we've been rebranded as CNA in 2019, and this was announced by Singapore Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong. Uh, we are now on different platforms, and I will show you. Okay, well, television is our main thing, but we're also on radio, uh, we we're on digital platform, and we have to do podcasts. It's one of our requirements too as correspondent. Um, CNA also hosts live events. Uh, CNA has 15 correspondents across 13 bureaus in 10 countries and territories, uh, which includes China, Japan, South Korea, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Thailand, and Vietnam. And we have access to um, a correspondent network, uh, uh, which is um, run and held by FSN um, in the Americas, Europe, India, the Middle East, and Africa. And as you can see, this is the list of awards CNA has been winning over the uh, past few years. Okay, this is a list of some of my uh, recent stories that I have been delivering from Japan as Japan correspondent. Um, I don't wanna say this in front of the cabinet of secretary and government officials, but some of the top stories that I have been covering was on the resignation of senior vice ministers due to uh, several reasons. Uh, and I've also done um, a story on the Johnny's uh, sexual abuse scandal. Um, and I have done some positive stories on uh, uh, social issues of children and the elderly coming together under an event sponsored by Singapore Airlines. Um, and recently I've been doing a story on tourism, how Japan is drawing more tourists, even more than uh, before the COVID period. And you see on this side on the top, um, I do stories on Japan's relationship with ASEAN Southeast Asia, and one of them on how Japanese firms are doing in Myanmar. Uh, I also do um, long stories. Normally my story is about three to five minutes long. Um, my longer piece is about 25 minutes. Uh, recently I've been going back and forth to Fukushima and uh, for the reason of uh, the release of wastewater from Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. Uh, this has been so big, not only in the region, but worldwide, with um, concerns pouring in. So 
I went on the ground to talk to people there, uh, to residents, including fishermen, on how they feel about the releasing of wastewater from Fukushima nuclear plant. And also, um, I have um, gone to the labs where they actually test the fish they catch off uh, Fukushima. Another major issue that I've been um, taking up from time to time, Japan's defense. This is of big concern to the viewers in the region, um, especially since uh, Japan, Mr. Kishida, Prime Minister Kishida announced in December last year that Japan wants to uh, step up its defense capability and doubled its defense spending from 1% of its GDP to 2% over the next five years. Uh, so um, during the beginning of this year, I've been going to the southern part of Japan to show how the self-defense force is trying to step up its defense capability. I went to Amami Oshima, to the bases there. I went to um, Ishigaki Island, also to Yonaguni. Now, in Ishigaki, I also did a story about the Senkaku, which China also claims and call Diaoyu. Um, I have to also, I'll say um, Senkaku and Diaoyu, both names, um, because uh, that's the stance CNA takes. Uh, we have to remain neutral. Um, I talked to the fishermen there who actually go near uh, Senkaku to fish. I asked them whether I can accompany them to be near Senkaku and see what's happening there with my own eyes but I was turned down. Basically, there was a change of law that only fishermen can go near that area. And every time the fishermen go, it's the Coast Guard that have to accompany them to the Senko because there are the Chinese Coast Guards out there too, so to avoid any, any um, dangerous situation. So uh, those are basically the kinds of stories I've been doing this year, and also um, I've been doing from time to time stories on foreign workers in Japan. Um, the law has been changing. As you know, uh, many um, people from ASEAN have been coming to Japan to work as um, so-called trainees, unskilled workers. The main objective um, was uh, basically to have them come to Japan, acquire skills, and bring them back home so that they can um, actually uh, do business or um, can help the people in their own countries um, through the skills they acquired in Japan. But the reality is that many companies in Japan hire them to make up of, of, for the labor shortage in their companies, especially in factories or um, in the situation where labor is hard. Well, Japan actually needs a lot of them because of the falling population, the fast aging society. And um, I did a 25-minute piece on uh, the uh, Vietnamese uh, who's um, here in Japan as um, helpers, um, on Indonesians, um, and I think the stories were well received um, because it actually addressed um, how they are treated in Japan, what kind of problems need to be addressed. And actually, the Japanese government is trying to address more of the problems so that more of um, the foreign workers from ASEAN especially will be encouraged to come to Japan and work. So thank you for your attention. And I believe that I will have more opportunities to discuss issues with our panelists. And if you have questions, please be, uh, feel free to ask me questions. I do have a video of CNA, but can I run it? Uh, how long is it? About a minute or so. A minute? Uh, go, <laughs> I go, think. Go for it. Okay, um, how can I run it? Yeah, uh, I think it's in the system somewhere, but. Oh. Uh. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah, here it is. Okay, I all right. <laughs> Never mind, you can no. watch it on YouTube. Thank you so much oh, for your okay. time. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Ishida, for a uh, very uh, TV journalist precision in time <laughs> management. And I'm really glad to hear that as a keen uh, trained fisherman, I might actually qualify to go to Senkaku <laughs> Island. <laughs> so now I would like to ask a few questions to our panelists present here. We would appreciate a brief reply from each of you first. 
and pre-deploy within uh, 78 seconds each. And my first question is to uh, Professor Koga. I would like to ask you about your uh, big vision for Japan-ASEAN cooperation in the Indo-Pacific region. What is the significance of Japan-ASEAN friendship and cooperation <coughs> in the face of the US, China, and rising power of India? All right, uh, thank you very much for your question, uh, Professor Sato. So uh, basically, the, uh, I probably like would repeat the, uh, what the other panelists said, uh, the, uh, the significance of the uh, Japan uh, and also the ASEAN. Uh, the, uh, um, Cooperation itself, and also the, uh, their kind of presence in the in the Pacific could be the, uh, the uh, they are going they are providing the sort of option uh, to the those the uh, the countries, and then the uh, because uh, currently the uh, there are many uh, the uh, uh, the aspects of the uh, U.S. China uh, competition, and then as I mentioned in the presentation, uh, the uh, it's not going away anytime soon. So uh, most likely the, uh, the United States, uh, so, sorry, the uh, Japan uh, would like to uh, closely align with the United States and then that is completely understandable. But at the same time, uh, if you align too much, then that means the, uh, you are actually making the uh, division in the region. Um, on, the hand, on the other hand, the ASEAN is now like weakening uh, the, uh, its the centrality and the unity in many reasons. Uh, we can discuss this uh, later on. But then the, uh, each individual ASEAN member states would actually uh, want to align with the uh, particular great power uh, as well. And then that is actually going to uh, the, uh, further weaken the ASEAN unity. So um, by present, uh, being there, uh, the Japan ASEAN cooperation uh, itself actually gives the, uh, some other uh, strategic options. And then the, uh, because the ASEAN's point of view uh, in, the, in the past week is the uh, focusing on uh, more than uh, more cooperation than the competition or rivalry. Uh, so in that sense, the uh, ASEAN could be the uh, forum where uh, the you could actually uh, rely on uh, for uh, channels of communication and then they mitigate the tension, uh, if not resolving it, but then possibly the mitigating it uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, over those uh, the relationship. So um, I, I think like that's the, uh, the, uh, uh, the response I could have. Thank you. Thank you, Koga-san. Uh, my next question is to uh, Professor Prasutis Kiti-san. Uh, we understand that Japan and ASEAN achieved a lot so far for mutual cooperation, but there are also different challenges, such as climate change and uh, the ongoing uh, the crisis in Myanmar. Could you provide your vision on what is the most serious obstacle or how to overcome these difficulties in the near future? It's a big question in uh, 78 seconds, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, I think you are muted. We can't hear you. Hello, do you hear me? Yeah, you're good now. All, all right. Uh, can I clarify the question a bit? You mean challenges between Japan and ASEAN or geopolitical challenges? Uh, not between Japan and ASEAN, but uh, the issues, challenging issues Japan and ASEAN have to uh, cooperatively deal with. Okay, I think, first of all, Japan uh, should have more awareness that ASEAN value Japan so much in many fronts, not only in, in economics and trade, investment, but also uh, in, in non-traditional security. I think Japan can help, can assist ASEAN a lot in terms of climate change, capacity building, even uh, cyber security. I would like to pinpoint the ASEAN Japan Cyber Security Capacity Building Center. I think uh, cyber security become more and more important. And the fact that Japan and ASEAN has that center is very significant because I cannot think about having the same center with other 
great power at this point. So that means ASEAN has a very high trust in Japan. Therefore, uh, I think Japan can have different approach in security with, with ASEAN rather than uh, traditional security, new security issue would be the way that Japan can engage with uh, the whole ASEAN. And that will provide a very important option for ASEAN country rather than relying on either side of the great power, China or the US. Thank you, Kitty san now I have a question for Professor Kim. Uh, I know that your research will focus on Korea and India, as well as Australia, which are also important actors in the region. But what was the Japan-ASEAN partnership mean for these countries? Thank you, Sato-sensei, for uh, the question that we can actually lead to uh, a lot of um, uh, meaningful policy implications to many uh, other regional countries. Uh, perhaps I can uh, try to uh, connect three different dots uh, in answering that question. The first one is Japan-ASEAN partnership, and the uh, second one is uh, security network in terms of framing that partners, not entirely, but at least uh, some partially. And uh, the last point uh, that I would like to connect is uh, Japan's uh, uh, the leadership, Japan's uh, leading role uh, in the, the region. Um, um, the, one of the, um, so what's the, what's the new about uh, Japan's contribution in the region the considering uh, its own um, uh, the contribution that it accumulated in the past, including uh, its uh, the contribution to building APEC, uh, and uh, the, the later on, later on, the initiating the idea of quadrilateral uh, security dialogue, and also now um, the, the FOIP, the free and open in the Pacific, and also Japan uh, is a key. Uh, the actor in uh, C CPTPP comprehensive and progressive agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership. And uh, what's the new uh, aspect that we can see from the framework of security network is that while building Japan's partnership and cooperation with countries other than uh, the U.S. and other, the U.S. key treaty allies, and ASEAN is a, a, one of the, um, the good example. So uh, the back in 2017 in Japan's diplomatic blue book uh, published by Ministry of Foreign Affairs, there is a, uh, the, the, personally I think that's important that it, it put that so Japan and ASEAN partnership um, as um, that uh, so the, during, uh, pres, uh, during Prime Minister uh, the Abe's uh, the visit to the Philippines to uh, be part of Japan ASEAN summit, uh, summit meeting in Abe, uh, expressed uh, his expectations for Japan and ASEAN to jointly lead uh, the world in advancing the free and open international order. So, um, uh, so this um, so Japan's partnership uh, with ASEAN uh, and Japan's new role as uh, the one of the leading the actor in the region that, uh, in fact, to give uh, the, the meaningful policy implication for other countries. Uh, the like uh, Korea, uh, India, and uh, Australia. And, uh, and again, um, the building on my talk, it, it does go uh, hand in hand with uh, the US, the regional, the strategic uh, interest. So the, um, perhaps I can um, the, uh, again point out that so we need to try to, to figure out what is new and addition uh, in the U.S. bilateral security alliances and uh, trying to learn uh, from the experience of uh, the preeminent uh, the cooperation examples such as Japan and ASEAN partnership. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jie. Okay. Now to uh, Ms. Chakravorty. Uh, I understand that you are interested in ASEAN's relations with non-ASEAN countries. What are your thoughts on the impact of a stronger relationship between Japan and ASEAN on other Indo-Pacific countries? Thank you, um, Dean Sato. 
Um, I, I think the two spaces to really watch in terms of that are going to be security, which will largely be maritime and infrastructure. And we can, maybe we can get, to, get into infrastructure later in the conversation. Um, but I just want to share an anecdote really quick. I was recently at the home of the Indian ambassador to Japan um, at, at dinner. And um, there were a bunch of people there in senior roles with the Indian Embassy in Japan. There was a defense attache as well. And everybody was talking about how the Japan posting used to be like the sort of the break. You know, it was, you get two, three years of really not having to do much. You get to relax. And then you move, you know, to another posting that's probably a lot busier than this. And how in the last few years that has completely changed. And Japan has become one of the busiest postings for the Indian Foreign Service. And I think that's very telling in terms of activity really picking up um, uh, in terms of Japan-India partnerships that then affect sort of the ASEAN region in very significant ways. And the defense attache who is in Japan now represents all three armed forces, so that's Air Force, Army, and Navy, but he is from the Navy. And he said that that's going to change, and in the years to come, India will have an air attache, a military attache for the Army, and a naval attache, partly because those partnerships are picking up as well, which is also, I think, an indicator of something, and partly because he, as somebody from the Navy, just doesn't have the time to take care of the air, air attache and military attache roles because so much is happening between Japan and India when it comes to maritime. Um, so I think maritime infrastructure and maritime safety have become uh, an even bigger area of focus and will have a domino effect on the region. Um, Japan has joint naval exercises it's doing to gain interoperability. You have the Malabar series with I think it's Japan, US, India, um, and now even Australia. Uh, there's an annual joint exercise they've begun just with the Indian Navy, and they're starting to sell uh, military equipment to ASEAN members. I think having a strong military presence in the waters, not just the, the JMSDF, the Japan Marine Self-Defense Force, which incidentally embarked on its biggest yet Indo-Pacific tour this year, but pooling resources together to have a regionally strong military presence in the waters. This is not a wartime tool, right? This is a peacetime tool. This is to maintain order. Um, and especially as India, Japan, and the region are deeply concerned about China's growing influence and military presence in the waters. The Indian Ocean is as crucial to the region's security as the Pacific Ocean, not to mention the South China Sea. Um, and so I think both Japan and India have a vested interest in contributing to the regional maritime security and stability. Also the Bay of Bengal, which has very important sea lines of communication going through that part. Um, it's also important for me to mention that it is significant that none of these partners are expeditionary in nature. So, you know, the idea is to ensure the safety of borders and stability in the region. Naval readiness and regional cooperation is about diplomacy more than anything else, right? It's optics, it's deterrence. Um, so Japanese investment in Southeast Asia, I think is designed to sort of strengthen each country's capability to provide their own security, but also to enhance the intra-regional uh, economic integration so that they have more strategic autonomy when making a choice, I think these sort of extra regional partnerships become very important. So I think there is sense, a lot of sense and, and also hopefulness in these, in these ex-ASEAN partnerships um, that will end up making the, this very fast growing region safer. Thank you very much. Okay, now to Ms. Ishida. Uh, in the debate over the Tokyo Olympics and Fukushima treated water, we often see aspects of rising nationalism. What does Japan-ASEAN friendship and cooperation mean 
in terms of mitigating nationalism? Mitigating nationalism, well, that is a very difficult question. And Tokyo Olympic Games, uh, Fukushima decommissioning are separate issues. But okay, let me take them separately. Uh, the Tokyo Olympic Games, Tokyo 2020 was actually held in 2021, as you know, and it was held in the middle of the pandemic. Um, and I covered um, almost every single day um, during that period of the Tokyo Olympic Games and also the Paralympic Games. Um, there was a bubble, um, no audience. Um, it was all about how many people will actually view the Olympic Games. Um, it didn't feel like the Olympic Games were real, um, myself being uh, there on site. Uh, but I think a lot of people in Southeast Asia was watching. Um, I don't know if they felt nationalistic, but I'm sure that they were cheering uh, for their um, Olympic players. Unfortunately, Singapore didn't win any medals at this mm -hmm. Olympic Games, but we did have um, superstars such as uh, Joseph Schooling, and one badminton player has actually become a world champion that year for the first time from Singapore. So I'm sure that in that sense, it sort of uh, raised the uh, uh, nationalistic nationalism, but in a positive sense. So that's one thing about the Tokyo Olympic Games. But um, of course, on uh, the dark side was that scandals came to light, uh, monetary scandals, and that has impacted uh, the bid of um, Sapporo for the Winter Olympic Games. Now, um, Fukushima, uh, you know, there's been concern not only from ASEAN, but from all over the world on the discharge of wastewater because the um, what some countries call radioactive wastewater um, could damage uh, sea life. Uh, so in order to explain, show, I've been going down to Fukushima, how people felt about um, uh, how the water uh, was dealt with and how um, marine products was uh, dealt with. Um, uh, still, um, I've heard that recently in Singapore, um, it's developed a system where they can test uh, radiation of food products. So it shows that um, Singapore is quite concerned about um, the radioactive level in the Fukushima waters. Um, uh, and decommissioning is continuing, and I think the region is watching uh, carefully on how it's going to go, especially as there are countries in Southeast Asia that are interested in nuclear power. Uh, I've been hearing that's the case in Indonesia and Vietnam. So that's what I have to say. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much, Ms. Ishida. Okay, uh, now we have some time for discussion among the participants, but uh, I would like to uh, raise a couple of points on which we uh, would like to focus our discussion. And I think the one is, uh, as Jui mentioned, the role of nemawashi, the root binding in Japan-ASEAN relationship. I think this is a very important feature of the partnership, which has lasted for a long time in a very amicable fashion. I remember reading a biography of uh, Condoleezza Rice, who was working in the Bush administration as a secretary, secretary of state. And she wrote about her experience of having to uh, do a little skit in the ASEAN meeting. And she, she played piano. She was really good at it. But she talked about her experience in such a negative way that she hated doing that. And, and that probably has a reason why she wasn't very happy about going to ASEAN meetings after that. And meanwhile, every Japanese diplomat know that uh, singing karaoke together with uh, ASEAN diplomat is such an important part of diplomacy in the region. And with that kind of relationship, the, I think Japan has really cultivated the goodwill in, in the ASEAN region. But my question is, has there been enough nemawashi 
on such issues as Myanmar. I think we, we have done enough nemawashi in terms of continuing to maintain dialogue with the regime and uh, engage the, the, the military leadership of uh, uh, the Myanmar rather than just uh, isolate. But uh, at the same time, have we done enough nemawashi, the root binding, for a possible contingency in Myanmar? I think the issue is becoming ever more important today to have a kind of coordinated plan uh, if anything goes wrong, wrong or right, I don't know, uh, but in unstable, uh, then we, we need the regional uh, coordinated response. So do we have enough nemawashi on that? And the other issue I would like to raise is, does nemawashi also reach the United States? Sometimes the US is uh, not very much part of nemawashi, and I'm not meaning to blame Japan, but because the US just going ahead and do things before <laughs> talking to other friends. So, so that's my first point. I would like you to uh, kind of briefly respond. Um, well, I just, I was very intrigued by this whole Troika model that they adopted this year, which, so basically, I think up until now, the current chair of ASEAN uh, was responsible, you know, for, 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 for example, the conflict in Myanmar. And now I think they've decided that it will be the previous year's chair, the current chair, and the next year's chair. Uh, I think they will all sort of be tasked um, with, you know, the responsibility of shepherding leaders into action and unity on, on Myanmar. So I think that, to me, that was really intriguing and I guess adds a, another element of nimawashi, um, especially when it just seems previous efforts to facilitate a ceasefire or peace have been largely unsuccessful. Uh, and I think Japan sort of seems to be working from outside, uh, from the outside on that, and I'm not very literate on that, but I think this Troika model is, is, is super interesting that they're doing this for the first time. Thank you. Anybody else? <laughs> I'm gonna okay. just yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, so the Nemawashi, yeah. I, I guess the, uh, uh, as the uh, Professor uh, Sato said, uh, the Nemawashi is the kind of like the, uh, uh, the, uh, the factor that the ASEAN could share because the ASEAN has the uh, ASEAN way that I emphasize the importance of the consultation and consensus. So uh, before kind of like bringing up on the, uh, some agenda on the table, then they would actually need to uh, consult and talk about it. So it's kind of similar to the, uh, what the uh, Japan is uh, doing. So in that sense, the, uh, I think they share uh, those kind of culture. But um, on the Myanmar issue, I, I think the, uh, what I'm concerned about is that the uh, ASEAN countries are not necessarily united. So even though like, the Japan is trying to reach out the ASEAN member states, their kind of responses might be different. Mm -hmm. And then if that's a different, then the, uh, what, I mean, like Japan cannot do anything about it. And then Japan respects the importance of the uh, five-point uh, five consensus, which the ASEAN actually reached the uh, agreement with the uh, Myanmar, uh, and then the Myanmar never actually implemented it. So uh, in that sense, the, uh, the, uh, the Japan supports the, uh, this five-point consensus, uh, five, five consensus, but then the, if ASEAN is not going to uh, the, uh, take the uh, initiative, uh, there's only uh, and like so much that the uh, Japan can do. So the, uh, that's a kind of the, uh, dilemma, I guess, the uh, Japan has uh, with the uh, ASEAN. Thank you. Anybody else? Then let me move on to my second point. Uh, Professor Kim brought up the issue of uh, the centrality of the bilateral alliances with the United States in this region's security. But uh, she also mentioned the growing uh, efforts to network with other uh, partners in the region and, and possibly outside the region as well. The, 
avoidance of the bipolar flaming of the regional security here is probably a common concern for both Japan and Southeast Asian countries. But at the same time, uh, as Professor Koga mentioned, there is a dilemma uh, because uh, the unity within ASEAN may or may not be available uh, all the time. So, so given that, what is your view about this growing uh, minilateral partnerships in the region, which involves not all Southeast Asian countries, but some selected ones? Anybody would like to take on that? Uh, Koga-san, yes. yes. Uh, so ju just the, uh, uh, this is uh, my opinion, but the, uh, I, I think the, uh, uh, the problem is that the existing uh, international, uh, the regional architecture led by ASEAN has the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, limitation. And then the, uh, this is why uh, the military frameworks, uh, the, uh, in terms of the uh, strategic, I mean, in the strategic sense, came up, and then Quad and then AUKUS, those are the uh, kind of military frameworks which are, are, are fundamentally different from the uh, old kind of uh, the military framework that focuses on the uh, functional uh, capabilities, such as uh, the uh, uh, plus three cooperation, uh, focusing on the non-traditional security issues uh, between the uh, uh, Japan, South Korea, and uh, uh, the uh, China, or the, uh, uh, the five power defense cooperation uh, that focuses on the more kind of uh, consultation over the, uh, uh, the strategic environment in the Southeast Asia and so on and so forth. So um, this is the, uh, the uh, so the reason rise of the militarism came uh, because of the change in the uh, strategic environment in East Asia or in the Pacific. Um, what happened was the, uh, there was also the uh, concern coming from the, uh, some of the ASEAN countries that the, uh, those kind of minilateral frameworks would the, uh, replace the, uh, with ASEAN because ASEAN is weakening and ASEAN might not actually play a pivotal role uh, anymore like in the region. Um, but I, I guess the, uh, the, uh, there's a certain kind of misunderstanding uh, between them. And uh, I, I guess the, what we need to do is the, we have to kind of clarify uh, the division of labor uh, between the, uh, what ASEAN is doing and what ASEAN can do and what kind of the, uh, the uh, task the military frameworks can uh, provide. And then some of them are actually overlapping. Like if you take a look at the quad uh, activities, right? Uh, the other uh, the uh, vaccination provision uh, that is the, uh, appreciated by the, some of the ASEAN member states. And also the uh, other certain kind of non-traditional security issues, uh, including the uh, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, uh, the, uh, that would actually help out uh, the, uh, uh, responding to the uh, natural disasters uh, in the uh, Southeast Asia as well. So um, the, uh, rather than just kind of the, uh, saying the uh, framework may actually impede uh, against each other, I, I guess the, uh, what we need to do is the uh, communication line uh, between those kind of frameworks are going to be very, very important. And then identifying the division of labor, institutional division of labor uh, between the uh, Quad and then the, uh, uh, the uh, ASEAN, for example, would actually uh, more kind of facilitate uh, regional stability uh, the, uh, over time rather than the, uh, uh, the destability uh, thing, the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, regional stability. So that's the, my opinion. Okay, thank you. Jie? Thank you, Sato Sensei, for uh, the great uh, the talking point. Uh, I think this question and the inquiry actually coming from, uh, ironically, how um, the, the significant role that uh, ASEAN has done so far uh, since its establishment in, uh, the back in 1960s. And it did, it did the role um, uh, to compare to other sub-regions uh, in Asia, like Northeast Asia, in South Asia, but uh, Southeast Asia is uh, compared to other sub-regions, it, it is more institutionalized. It does uh, share certain norms like ASEAN, way that uh, Professor Koga already mentioned, and uh, the new, um, not new, but emerging 
uh, the, the requ rem uh, emerging the demand in terms of security network and the minilateralism does uh, the face uh, the issue of how the unity of ASEAN and institutionalization within ASEAN will respond to this. I think uh, the one of the, uh, the in, in fact, the, uh, in both uh, China uh, and the US uh, is engaging uh, in, uh, in, in ASEAN, they're using various ways, including minilateralism. And how the China criticize uh, minilateralism, then we can see that what's the, the problem to hear. So the many of Chinese literature um, uh, simultaneously they criticize minilateral, minilateralism as a new phenomenon characterized by de-ASEANization strong ideological orientation and emphasis on traditional security issues due to the regional country's dissatisfaction with multilateral mechanisms. So that means is a criticism from China that means this minilateralism is, uh, the, is uh, the counter strategy against the multilateralism in Asia and the endeavor uh, sent endeavor coming from the US and US treaty allies uh, the focused on minilateralism is indeed um, the, the harming the, uh, the multilateralism and the ASEAN, uh, the, the values in Asia. So, but at the same time, we can also see that, uh, uh, not necessarily fragmentation, but uh, in terms of the building diplomatic uh, strategy with uh, individual ASEAN countries, also seen in China's diplomacy as well. In terms of South China Sea dispute, we saw that China is approaching, um, you know, to building, you know, one-on-one -on -one, uh, diplomatic uh, sort of the solution. In, indeed, China's primary approach to South China Sea disputes is that sovereignty issue has been resolved in bilateral platform. Uh, it's not in multilateral platform. So I think um, so the, the problem of uh, how the minilateralism will change or affect uh, at all to the multilateralism and institutionalism in Asia, in Asia represented by ASEAN uh, is the still unfolding story Then we need to see how this will affect um, the, the current uh, institutions in Asia. Okay. Thank you, Jay. Uh, now I'd like to uh, open the questions, the floor for Q&A from the floor. Uh, okay, uh, Professor Negi in the front. Thank you very much for a great panel. My name is Stephen Nagy from the International Christian University. Um, I have lots of questions, but I'm just going to try and link a few of the last comments from Professor Koga, Professor Kitty, and Professor Kim. Um, uh, Professor Koga mentioned the heterogeneity and the existing challenges within ASEAN. Kitty talked about platforms for cooperation moving forward, and um, Professor Kim talked about the rise of minilateralism as a response to the challenges of the ASEAN centrality. Um, I think what we didn't discuss is the real challenges within ASEAN. We have a demographic challenge there, uneven development, corruption, um, and the extra-regional players like Japan, South Korea, um, really are going to have declining resources in terms of their ability to deal with the challenges uh, that ASEAN requires. Um, how does a shrinking Japan and a shrinking South Korea continue to contribute to ASEAN's centrality and building strategic autonomy. So I'm wondering if you could link these two ends of the challenge. Um, the reality that ASEAN is very heterogeneous and has many problems and its rise is not a given. And the reality that the providers, those ex extra regional partners are having declining resources in terms of being able to provide stability. And again, foster that strategic autonomy, allowing ASEAN to be a, 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 a different pole in this system. Thank you. Okay. Who would like to respond? I think we both have poetry, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right. Um, okay, so <clears throat> um, thank you very much. Uh, th thank you for really interesting the uh, question. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> I think the, uh, uh, there are two sides here. 
uh, the ones uh, as you artic uh, the, uh, Professor Nagi uh, articulate, the, uh, uh, there's a declining kind of resources uh, that the, uh, Japan and the South uh, Korea and others are considering the uh, demographic change and uh, economic uh, like resources. So uh, the, uh, they need to do something. At the same time, ASEAN is facing the difficulties in maintaining the, its unity, uh, given the uh, lots of the uh, internal kind of dis dissonance are particularly caused by the uh, uh, those the uh, uh, Myanmar coup like the uh, other incident. So um, I, I think the uh, on the one I, one thing is that the uh, those kind of minilateralism uh, the uh, between the uh, uh, U.S. allies and partners can actually get together and coordinate uh, their resources together and provide more uh, to the ASEAN because the uh, uh, there are only so much you can do by yourself. And then the uh, Japan and then uh, actually we uh, uh, understand and also South Korea also understand. There may be like their resources are still uh, there, but then over time it's not going to be the uh, uh, abundant. So coordination between them and then providing some the uh, uh, public goods to the ASEAN countries could help uh, empowering the uh, uh, ASEAN more and then sustaining the ASEAN centrality. On the other hand, I think the, uh, for ASEAN, this may be a little bit controversial, but then the, uh, I would say ASEAN is to some extent o already overstretched. So I think like ASEAN started off from the, uh, uh, concentrating on the Southeast Asia to East Asia, broader East Asia, and now in the Pacific. I don't think the ASEAN has the uh, su sufficient resources to reach out like every corner of the in the Pacific. And in that sense, the ASEAN should actually take a look at the, uh, what they can do, uh, and then the, uh, look at the uh, other kind of Southeast Asia side more closely, and then they facilitate and they promote, uh, they invest more kind of resources on the Southeast Asian cooperation. Right now, like, it's difficult. Myanmar is actually the uh, kind of de facto the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, no member because they can't actually come into the summit or like for uh, the high level meetings. But uh, the, uh, I think the, uh, still the, uh, there are nine members and also the uh, East Timor is coming in. So uh, the uh, facilitating uh, the uh, uh, more kind of cooperation to narrow the gap uh, in the uh, uh, economic sense and then uh, social stability sense, that would actually help uh, the maintaining the uh, uh, ASEAN centrality and then ASEAN wisdom Okay. Joey, would you like to jump on? <laughs> I mean, honestly, I think that I have panelists who have far deeper expertise um, in, in the space. Um, I do think it's a very interesting question um, because the diversity is just so wide. I mean, you have, you know, a country like Singapore where the GDP per capita is like $83,000. And then you have Myanmar where it's like $1,000, you know. Um, and demographically too, uh, religious-wise, you have ethno-state, religion-wise, you have ethno-states and countries that are quite different from that. And, um, so I, I don't know. I you know just I think the, the lack of unity we've seen on Myanmar, we've seen even on China, the South China Sea, it's been I think difficult to get sort of a joint response out for that. Certain states are sort of not. I I, I really don't know. I mean, my one thought in terms of possible solutions uh, for a more viable future would be courting these ex ASEAN nations to kind of each country fills a gap that the other one has. So, you know, if it's population, definitely that's India. There's a lot of people. The U.S. has a lot of resources. Um, I think just diversifying the portfolio in terms of partnerships with ex ASEAN nations is probably one really promising way to go. Uh, and I think the U.S. has had sort of, you know, its own issues. I think there's a little bit of schizophrenia in Washington about ASEAN. Um, I think you've seen, I think the Barack sort of under Obama's administration, you saw, I think, a lot more engagement with ASEAN. And that's when they sort of appointed the first ambassador for ASEAN. And, uh, you know, President Obama actually attended ASEAN summits and things like that. And then I feel like they've pulled back, pulled back quite a bit under Trump and the sort of maybe coming back under, under Biden. Um, I know there was sort of some sensitivity around the fact that he recently skipped the ASEAN summit to go to, you know, G20. But um, 
I think there's a lot of potential, I think, with, at least with the current administration to kind of bring the U.S. back a little bit, even though we, what we really want to avoid is the two sort of super block rivalries, and we want to diversify that. But I think the U.S. would be another good place to look, I guess. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's too bad the President Biden doesn't look like somebody who wouldn't like karaoke singing, so. <laughs> but anyway, uh, uh, Sat Sato Sensei, yes. may I jump in yes. a bit? Uh, uh, Kiritan? Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I think uh, the issue of ASEAN unity cannot be expected quite a while ago. And we may need to take it as a given. Therefore, I think whenever ASEAN talk about centrality, it seems to be the case that ASEAN afraid that it's going to be overlooked, like the forming of the Quad in the Indo-Pacific strategy and earlier in the East Asia Summit. In the 2005, whether it should be ASEAN plus three, ASEAN plus six, and so on, ASEAN always care about their central role. And when they fear that they would be overlooked, they would emphasize centrality, centrality. If, if not, they do not say about centrality that much. And I think here we need to work on minilateralism in ASEAN. Minilateralism in ASEAN itself. Because it cannot be expected that our ASEAN country will move together in uh, many issues, Myanmar, uh, on China, and so on. We need to work with like a like-minded countries, starting from original member of ASEAN, Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, Philippines, and Thailand, and probably Vietnam, they need to be the core country in ASEAN. But if we want to work with uh, ASEAN in terms of Mekong issue, of course, Laos, Cambodia, Myanmar, Vietnam, Thailand uh, would be participating. So I think we we need to, to look, have that perspective in working with ASEAN. And we cannot over expect uh, from ASEAN. Uh, and in any case, ASEAN will have to, so far they, they adopt hedging strategy. Hedging strategy, that means they would like to diversify their tie with a great power, major powers, and country like Japan, India, would be important for ASEAN in their hedging strategies. And, and a little bit on, on Myanmar, I think we need more consultation between ASEAN country and also Japan. And even China, I don't think we have reached out uh, that much. And working with ASEAN, maybe it's time, time has come that we need to work more with minilateral in ASEAN rather than all the 10 countries. I think that kind of thinking has been formed in ASEAN recently as well. Thank you. Thank you, Kitty Tang. Uh, I'd like to take just one short question from the floor because there are three uh, online questions and I'd like to uh, address them all if possible. So uh, let's see. Uh, Oh, okay, Barai Sensei there. Uh, thank you. I think we have not talked anything about the elephant in the house, that is the war in Ukraine, and uh, how Russia is dealing with this, and at the same time, how Russia is defeating the whole collective West. In this context, if China and Russia, Russia with military power, China with economic power, if they join together, and then on the side by side, if we see India on the one side, close relationship with Russia, South Asia or ASEAN, a divided house, and Japan in this way. So balkanization of Asia in this way, when Russia and China are joining, as well as China, uh, USA, South Korea, Japan, and other countries, they are joining together, how this will shape the future of world uh, as we are thinking that the theme of the uh, conference here is shaping the new world from Asia Pacific, how this is going to shape the world. Thank you. Okay, uh, that's a kind of big question, but uh, maybe Jay, would you like to take that? Sure. Um, 
uh, we, uh, there are the building evidence, the building evidence of how China and Russia uh, is making their uh, the partnership to the next level in terms of depth and breadth. Uh, and there are the numerous uh, the literature uh, at one corner arguing that they are uh, just, just, it's a, uh, just normal the relations to another the extreme end that they already the formed the military alliance. And uh, among this, uh, considering this uh, the broad spectrum of contemplating on the where the China and Russia relations is going on, uh, it seems that, uh, it, well, the, the predicting any uh, new blocks uh, in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, it seems that we need um, to you know, observe more uh, the unfolding the evidence to see any uh, immediate, uh, imminent uh, the risk uh, the, the between uh, the potential uh, the groupings as uh, Professor Barai just mentioned, like uh, between uh, China, Russia, and uh, the between uh, the already uh, the strong the, uh, security alliances centered on uh, the U.S. So I think that is a definitely meaningful question that we uh, unfortunately couldn't uh, discuss in depth today, but uh, definitely something that we need to uh, discuss in future opportunities. Yeah. Just mm -hmm. to uh, uh, kind of jump on to uh, Jay's point, uh, I think it's not so much that uh, we are destined to head toward the uh, the bipolarization of the international system, but rather the competition is between the forces of bifurcation and the forces of multipolarization. And this competition is taking place at multiple levels, and you will see uh, uh, on one hand uh, the the countries such as uh, Russia, China, and you know, India and South Africa and Brazil and the BRICS countries, you know, trying to enhance diplomatic partnership. On, on the other hand, uh, the G20 framework is uh, emerging and India is playing a very active part in it. So, so I think it's uh, much murkier than what appears on the surface. But anyway, uh, because of the shortage of time, I'd like to address at least some of the online questions here. And let me read it out for you. Uh, can ASEAN empowerment through dialogue with Quad and or closer security and economic ties may be seen by China as taking a side? If so, what are the risks and what are the solutions? And uh, one more question here. How has the ASEAN response to Japan's FOIP changed over the past years, particularly regarding the clarification of political postures of member states toward Japan's FOIP? So if any one of you want to address either one of the questions, please go ahead. Yeah, sure. Uh, okay, so the uh, uh, yeah, just quickly like to 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 yeah, uh, the uh, quick response. The first, I, I think the uh, China is going to the on the uh, ASEAN Quad communication. If that happens, then definitely like China is going to be concerned. I, I think the uh, uh, what they need to do is depoliticization of this kind of like a cooperation. Uh, if you just kind of talk, start talk uh, without any transparency, obviously that raises the uh, skepticism. Uh, within the uh, uh, China's uh, policy makers. So in that sense, I think the, uh, for me, uh, maybe like one possible solution is creating the uh, certain kind of a like quad secretariat. That is kind of like the paradox because the, uh, if you institutionalize more, uh, then that means the, uh, that could actually the, uh, uh, make the China more concerned. But uh, I think the creating this secretariat uh, of the uh, quad could communicate with the ASEAN secretariat so that like, they could actually talk about the uh, more kind of functional cooperations rather than the strategic issues to be focused. ASEAN, uh, on the ASEAN's reaction to the, uh, um, uh, the uh, Japan's FOIP, uh, at, at first the uh, uh, Japanese uh, FOIP was unclear, so that the, uh, some of the ASEAN member states were concerned about it, but then the, over time it got like, a little bit the, uh, clearer, uh, and then they more focused on the uh, uh, public goods, 
and then non-traditional security issues, infrastructure development, so and so forth, which ASEAN member states accept. But they don't want to use the same other term because it could actually be seen by China as the counter China strategy, no matter what. So what they did is they actually started up, that uh, created the uh, AOIP, ASEAN Outlook on the Indo-Pacific, so that they could actually use their own word uh, and then to facilitate the cooperation among the ASEAN member states with the uh, other regional states. Now, like what the uh, Japan and the ASEAN is doing is the, uh, synthesizing uh, this uh, uh, FOIP, FOIP and then also AOIP. So the uh, uh, ASEAN's attitude for the uh, Japan free and open in the past week becomes more, uh, I think, benign, and then the, uh, more the, uh, acceptable, I think. Okay. Ju? Um, well, I just maybe piggyback on that and, and do sort of a, a land angle on the FOIP. I think, for me, one of the things that has been interesting to watch is, in terms of Japan's outreach and partnerships, is the focus on connectivity, because I think that that sort of fosters a collective, uh, a collective aim, I think, to counter China's flagship BRI um, and coordinate, coordinate a response to those regional ambitions. So in the India-Japan partnership, for example, which does look at a lot of other sectors like economic development, um, energy security, science and tech, maritime, of course. Uh, but I think what's very interesting from a broad regional impact point of view is infrastructure, really in terms of connectivity projects. Um, as Professor um, Kim, uh, G.A. Kim, um, mentioned earlier, there was, you know, Prime Minister Kishida visited India earlier this year, and there was a bilateral sort of chat between him and Prime Minister Modi. And one of the th very interesting projects to me that came out of it was northeastern India. So northeastern India is basically an extremely remote, very disconnected, long ignored part of India uh, that borders with China, Bangladesh, and Myanmar. So it's actually a geopolitical, um, sort of geopolitically important and sensitive part of the world. And now it is a site of like nearly a thousand um, kilometers of new road construction that's financed by Japan. This is unprecedented in India. And it's meant to enhance regional connectivity and promote socioeconomic development in the region. And it's really interesting because the construction, which has already begun, because remember, Japan doesn't announce anything that isn't already happening, um, it will connect India with Southeast Asia by land. So I think that will be a real game changer. Uh, and then, of course, sub-regional conflict like Myanmar becomes even more pressing to really resolve. Um, but basically, this will challenge the BRI um, as a geo-economic project you know, aimed at reconfiguring Asia's regionalism. And I think in the long term, this could be really a significant counter in terms of a free and open Indo-Pacific Indo and Otherwise, you know, I mean, you have the VRI, which would kind of steer us away from an ASEAN centrality. Um, yeah, and I, I, there's so much focus on VRI. We, as news organizations, we, you know, I think we cover it all the time, every day. But I think it's not enough thought. We don't put enough thought anyway into sort of, you know, how, how do you sort of combat something that would otherwise create a hierarchical and interdependent economic order that would extend all the way from China through, you know, throughout the Eurasian continent. The other thing about Japan that's interesting to me is that it's making all these investments um, that will have a domino effect, but it is willing to put returns on, like, I don't know, a 50-year time frame. You know, it doesn't, it's not, it doesn't need immediate returns, and I think that's one of the advantages uh, when it comes to Japan investing also in, in these other countries. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, now it's uh, 12.31, we are a little over time, but uh, I, I would have to bring this uh, session to its closing with a few observations. And first of all, many thanks to all our panelists for their patience and thoughtful responses. I trust that the uh, discussions were very enriching and the concept was uh, very well grasped. And this uh, 50 years anniversary of Japan-ASEAN friendship is unfortunately marked by many ongoing crises on, on this planet, 
in Europe, in Middle East, and in Africa. And we might be even seeing signs of uh, um, impending uh, economic uh, turbulence uh, in different parts of the world, which may have a global uh, reach. So more than ever, we are facing a uh, need for coordinated international responses. And from that perspective, ASEAN-Japan cooperation is extremely important. The discussion highlighted the dilemma between the need for ASEAN unity in order to maintain the centrality of ASEAN as a diplomatic actor but at the same time, as uh, Kitty san mentioned, maybe it's time we make room for uh, individual Southeast Asian countries to cooperate in different uh, minilateral frameworks. So, so I think the issue was very well highlighted in the discussion here today. And this kind of track two dialogue is happening on this campus at Ritz American Asia Pacific University on a daily basis because of our very diverse uh, student body, where 50% of the students come from overseas, and many of them from the ASEAN region. And it's very fortunate that we could kick off the annual AP conference, Asia Pacific conference, with this uh, very uh, uh, formal uh, symposium here, thanks to the cooperation from the cabinet office. And I'd like to express my gratitude to all the staff members from the office and also all the, the supporting members from APU as well. Thank you very much. And finally, I think it's very important that uh, the media uh, is playing a very important role in this uh, symposium. And all these important dialogues are uh, participated by and communicated by the media representatives here. So I'd like to express my uh, Special uh, thanks to uh, Jui and Ishida-san also. So with that, I'd like to close this uh, symposium, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you very much. Thank you.